Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining me once again. Uh, unfortunately, it appears that there were some technical difficulties with the recording um, of the webinar a fortnight ago. So uh, I thought I'd just go through the presentation once more. Um, I will endeavor to remember as many of the questions that were asked on the night and try to answer them as we go along, because I think they were really useful questions. Um, so today we're going to talk about uh, a topic that I find particularly interesting, um, and hopefully you will too, and that is polymyalgia rheumatica. Here are my disclosures. So what are we going to cover today? Um, we'll naturally talk about what exactly is polymyalgia rheumatica, or I'll be referring to it as PMR from here on out. Um, we'll talk about what we know of the causes of polymyalgia rheumatica and what is still left to be found out. Uh, what are some of the common presentations of polymyalgia rheumatica and the symptoms people will feel? How your doctor may diagnose it? Um, what is the management of polymyalgia rheumatica and what is the natural timeline um, and history of the disease and some of the more frequently asked questions that my patients ask me. So what exactly is polymyalgia rheumatica? So for our Greek speaking members in the audience, it comes from um, the word polymyalgia, um, which basically means um, poly, my, many, and myalgia means muscle pain. Um, so this was first described um, as its own disease by a group of rheumatologists in 1956. So there were some rheumatologists in the United Kingdom who looked at their patients with rheumatoid arthritis, which is another um, autoimmune condition, and they found that there was a particular subset of their patients who uh, presented a little bit differently. Um, and what they found was these group, this group of patients presented with uh, widespread muscular pain um, without some of the damage that is usually expected with rheumatoid arthritis. They had high erythrocyte sedimentation rate, which so that means lots of inflammation in their blood tests. Um, and sometimes it was associated with fevers. And they called this new condition polymyalgia rheumatica. Um, so you will see that we have made a lot of progress since this first um, description in 1956, but in a lot of ways, not much has changed since then either. So who exactly gets PMR? Um, so as we mentioned in, in the brief beforehand, that it affects almost 1% of the population in their lifetime, um, and it is invariably a disease of um, the elderly. So it almost always occurs in the, um, those over the age of 50, um, though very rarely can occur in those younger than 50. Um, though, as we can see in the graph um, in the lower part of the screen there, um, most commonly affects people um, once they reach the age of 70s. Um, it does affect females um, in a 2 to 1 ratio to males, so they're twice as likely to get it as males um, and it is primarily a disorder um, of those who are Caucasian or of a um, particularly Scandinavian descent. It's not commonly seen in those who are um, of Middle Eastern or Asian ethnicity and we'll talk a little bit about why that may be later on. So what causes polymyalgia rheumatica? So we know it's an autoimmune problem, so that means your immune system, which normally fights infections, gets a bit confused and attacks things it shouldn't. Um, and in this case, um, it loves to attack areas such as tendons and bursas, and we'll talk a little bit about that. So even though it's called polymyalgia, Myalgia is a bit of a misnomer because myalgia suggests muscles. Um, however, if you were to take a sample of muscle tissue from people who suffer from polymyalgia rheumatica and look at it under a microscope, it would look completely normal. Um, because as I was mentioning, it tends to affect tendons. So that's where the muscles attach to the bones, as we can see in the diagram here. Um, as well as bursas, which are these little balls of fluid that sit between the muscles and bones that prevent them from rubbing up against each other. Now, why exactly does this happen? We're not fully sure. So we know there are some things that make you more likely and more predisposed to developing polymyodromatica. And some of those things include genes. So for instance, there's a gene here um, on the HLA-DR4 locus. So this is a gene that's important for how the immune system identifies self, so uh, its own tissues and its own cells, compared to things that are foreign to the body. So you can naturally imagine that it's important for autoimmune conditions such as polymyodromatica. And wouldn't you know it, um, this gene is more common in those who are of um, Northern European or Scandinavian descent, hence why it's a, dis a disease that primarily affects Caucasians. We also know there's a bit of a seasonal variation to polymyalgia rheumatica. Um, as we can see in the graphs here, it's more common in the summer, uh, more common to develop symptoms in the summer months when it's warmer 
And this suggests perhaps there's something in the environment that triggers uh, the disease in people who are already uh, prone to developing it. Um, what are some of these things that could be around in the environment that triggers it? Well, some people have thought perhaps there's some infections that can trigger it. Um, there have been many, many bugs that have been suggested as potential triggers for the disease um, because they have been noticed um, to be more common during pandemics um, for people to present with symptoms of polymyalgia rheumatica. So for instance, um, there was an uh, epidemic of pyrovirus back in the uh, mid 1990s, and there was an influx of patients developing polymyalgia rheumatica. However, whenever any of these bugs have um, been looked at later on and those results trying to be reproduced, we haven't really been able to prove that. So it's still a theory and something we need to look into a bit more, um, but perhaps there is something in the environment that um, can be blamed for triggering it. So basically, just to summarize it, um, we know that there are genes that make you more likely to develop polymyalgia rheumatica. There is most likely something in the environment that triggers those genes, whether it be something to do with the weather, um, perhaps some infection that can trigger it. Um, and then um, you can go on to develop PMR. So as we can see there, there's still a bit of a missing link. What causes people with some of the um, predispositions to developing PMR getting it? And those with those same predispositions not getting it, we're not quite sure what that missing link is. So watch this space realistically. So what are some of the common symptoms and how might someone present with polymyalgia rheumatica? Um, so the main symptom that, the, uh, that patients complain about is pain and stiffness. Um, this is primarily felt in the shoulders. Um, so the majority of patients develop shoulder pain. Um, and this can be initially one-sided. However, it almost always um, progresses to involve both sides of the body. Um, and this is described as an ache, um, mostly over the shoulder, but it can radiate down the arms and up into the neck. Um, and particularly patients find it difficult to raise their arms um, above their shoulders. Um, patients may also develop similar uh, pains in their hips, and that can be felt in the groin, um, on the side of the hips, and sometimes even in the back of the thighs. Some patients can present with pain um, distally, so that means further away from the center of the body, so that includes things such as the elbows, the wrists, the hands, the feet and toes. Um, and some patients present almost exclusively with this, but that is felt to be a lot less common. Um, the pain that these patients feel is what we call inflammatory type pain. So that means it's pain that's worse in the mornings. Um, it's associated with morning stiffness. So they feel really, really stiff in the morning, but as they get up and get moving, they start to loosen up a little bit. Um, and it's pain that improves with activity. So you can imagine this is different than your general mechanical pain, such as if you have an injury or some wear and tear kind of arthritis that tends to get worse the more you use it. And then patients can sometimes have systemic symptoms. And by systemic, we mean things that affect the whole body. So about a third of patients can feel quite fatigued. Um, some patients can develop fevers, as we mentioned earlier. Um, some patients can even notice that they've lost some weight. Um, and perhaps because of all of this, some patients even feel quite depressed as well. So these are some of the real life implications of PMR that my patients often complain about. Some of their daily um, activities that they find to be quite difficult. So this includes things such as putting on their jackets, um, doing up their bras in particular, um, finding it difficult to comb their hair or bend down to tie their shoes, or even finding it difficult to get out of a chair. So you can imagine it can be quite debilitating, particularly at the peak um, for patients to do a lot of the things that we take for granted every day. So what are some of the signs of polymyalgia rheumatica? What might your doctor look at to try to make this diagnosis? Um, so they'll feel for pain and tenderness in the areas we described, particularly in the shoulder, where that bursa, that ball of fluid sits below the bone um, and above the arm bone. Um, they'll have a feel on the side of the hips to see if those balls of fluid on the side are quite tender as well. Um, they'll have a look at the range of motion of your joints. Um, so people with polymyalgia rheumatica can often complain of weakness in the arms and legs. Um, however, they don't in fact have true weakness. That is to say they feel weak because they are feeling pain when they move their arms and it's naturally a little bit restricted in their range of motion. But when you assess their power, it's actually um, perfectly normal. So the doctor will assess how far you can move your joints and people with polymyalgia rheumatica will often find it difficult to raise their arm by their side up above their shoulder height. Um, 
beyond what we call 90 degrees there. Um, they may have some um, restriction in their hip movement um, and sometimes in their neck, but again, most of the time in those regions, it's uh, secondary to pain as well. They'll often look for swelling in your fingers and feet. Um, Whilst you can get some tenderness and what we say distal involvement in polymyalgia rheumatica, this is more important to rule out some of the other conditions that can present like polymyalgia rheumatica, which we'll talk a little bit more of later. And as I mentioned earlier, they will test your muscle strength um, because even though you may feel weak when the doctor examines it, um, the muscle strength should still be normal um, despite the pain and limitation in the range of motion. I believe um, a myotherapist in the audience last time asked, is there any particular test that that one can do um, to help identify polymyalgia rheumatica. And um, basically because of the bursitis, so that inflammation of the ball of fluid, any kind of impingement test will be positive in polymyalgia rheumatica. Um, so for instance, impingement tests or, or Hawkins tests essentially. Um, however, it's important to remember that that is not specific for polymyalgia rheumatica and you can get those um, positive in other conditions, which we'll, we'll talk about a bit later. So what exactly are the mimics of polymyalgia rheumatica? Because um, whilst it seems like a, a fairly straightforward condition, um, despite our best efforts, about 15% of those who are diagnosed of, um, with polymyalgia rheumatica actually go on to um, end up with a different diagnosis over time. Um, what are some of those other diagnoses that um, can be confused? Um, well, this includes things like rheumatoid arthritis, so I'm sure a number of you have heard of rheumatoid arthritis before. This is another autoimmune disorder um, where the immune system gets confused, but in this, take, in this case it tends to attack the joint linings. Um, some of the important differences between rheumatoid arthritis and PMR um, include that rheumatoid arthritis tends to go for the smaller joints first. So it usually starts out with joints such as the fingers and the toes before it goes on to involve things like the shoulders and hips. The joints will often be swollen and sore to touch, um, and they can sometimes be classic blood work um, suggestive of rheumatoid arthritis. And then over time, they may develop x-ray changes. So in fact, um, there is this entity that we refer to as polymyalgic onset of rheumatoid arthritis. So this is about 10% of patients who present almost exactly the same as polymyalgia rheumatica, but actually develop rheumatoid arthritis over time. So like I mentioned, they will eventually develop those that classic wrist and finger swelling. Um, they can have the positive blood work. And their pain is still inflammatory, but not as much as polymyalgia rheumatica. So just to remind ourselves, um, when we say inflammatory, it means that the pain is still worse in the morning, still associated with that morning stiffness that gets better with use, but it's perhaps not as dramatic in rheumatoid arthritis as it is in polymyalgia rheumatica. And whilst they still respond to the same treatment, um, as what we might use for PMR, it's not quite as dramatic um, in rheumatoid arthritis. So those can all be a, a little bit of a clue. And then obviously over time, they can develop those classic rheumatoid arthritis x-ray changes. Um, some of the other common mimics include other inflammatory disorders, so other autoimmune problems such as lupus or vasculitis. So these are usually widespread disorders that don't just isolate themselves um, to the joints. So naturally they would have other features other than just joint pain. Um, so some of these features can be things such as rashes, they can have organ involvement, and they usually have um, specific and classic blood work that can lead you in that direction. So myositis, myositis um, means inflammation of the muscles, and this can be caused by a number of things. Um, it can be caused by autoimmune problems, and sometimes it can be caused by medication as well. Um, so these patients have true muscle weakness. So as I mentioned earlier, PMR, you might feel weak because of the pain and the restriction in the range of motion, but the strength is still there. These patients, on the other hand, will have true muscle weakness, and they usually have higher levels of um, their muscle enzymes in their blood work. Osteoarthritis, so osteoarthritis is that wear and tear kind of arthritis we get over time as we get older. Um, so clues uh, regarding osteoarthritis um, can be that this pain is not usually inflammatory in osteoarthritis. So this is pain that's usually worse at the end of the day, worse after use, not really associated with too much morning stiffness, can have a few minutes, but usually not too much. Um, osteoarthritis usually begins um, asymmetrically, so that means on one side of the body um, before both sides, and they um, usually have classic x-ray changes suggestive of osteoarthritis. Fibromyalgia, um, 
On the other hand, fibromyalgia is a pain disorder. Um, so this is more of a sensitization problem where um, you can feel widespread body pain, have lots of chemical sensitivity, so sensitive to medications, sensitive to other senses such as light and sound, for instance. Um, so this is a diagnosis of exclusion. Um, these patients often present with um, fatigue being more of a bigger issue than you would in polymyalgia rheumatica, and they have more widespread tenderness as I was alluding to earlier. So it's not just usually isolated to the shoulder and hips, for instance. They feel um, pain um, mostly everywhere, realistically. And because it's a diagnosis of exclusion, these patients normally have completely normal blood work. Um, so that can be a bit of a clue there as well. And then lastly, we'll talk a little bit about rotator cuff disease. So the muscles of the shoulder um, are what we call the rotator cuff. So these are a group of muscles that help support and stabilize the shoulder. Um, and these can get damaged for a number of reasons. They can get damaged from excessive use. They can get damaged from injuries, for instance. Um, and that can give you pain in the shoulder. So as you can imagine, mostly this is often unilateral, so usually on one side, though you can get the same problem on both sides. And as I mentioned, usually after trauma or repetitive use. And again, given that this is more of an injury mechanism, um, their blood work is usually normal. And I've put there in small writing inflammatory, because whilst the pain from rotator cuff disease can be inflammatory, so again, worse in the morning with morning stiffness, it's usually to a much, much lesser extent than someone who is um, suffering from true polymyalgia rheumatica. Um, so this is just a bit of a diagram here. So again, just you've got lots of tendons and muscles around the shoulder. And again, you've got that ball of fluid bursa, and that can be inflamed as well in rotator cuff syndrome. Um, now, I've included um, this other condition just because there are some people in the audience who may be suffering from it and who, have made, uh, who may be diagnosed with it. And that's remitting seronegative symmetrical synovitis with pitting edema. So it's quite a mouthful. Um, so we usually refer to it as RS3PE for short. Um, and basically, this is thought to be a subgroup of polymyalgia rheumatica. So up to 10% of PMR cases. Um, is RS3PE. And why do we think it's a subgroup? So this occurs in the exact same population as those who develop polymyalgia rheumatica. So I mean, again, those over the age of 50, those who are primarily Caucasian with the same genes seem to develop this um, condition. And it responds exactly the same to therapy as polymyalgia rheumatica and usually follows that same timeline. So that's why we believe it's a subgroup of polymyalgia rheumatica, but they present quite uniquely. Um, so these patients usually have, um, as the name suggests, swelling in the hands and feet, and it's what we call pitting. So that means if you were to press your thumb into the skin, it leaves a bit of a dent, as you can see in that diagram there. They have synovitis, so that means um, swelling in the joints, particularly of the fingers and toes that are sore to touch. Um, however, this, uh, this can be um, distinguished from other conditions that cause swelling in the fingers, such as rheumatoid arthritis, because they don't usually have that classic pitting, and it responds exactly the same as polymyalgia rheumatic patients do. So I, I thought I'd include that there, just in case anyone was wondering um, about this unique presentation of PMR. So how exactly is PMR diagnosed? Unfortunately, there's no one gold standard test that um, can give you the diagnosis of polymyalgia rheumatica. So we have to rely on a combination of things. So we rely on the history, so how a patient might present, the way they describe their pain and their symptoms. We again look at those exam findings, so again, the tenderness and the restricted range of motion that you might notice on examination. And we look at some of their blood tests and we'll talk about how that might be useful a bit later. Um, if that is not enough to make the diagnosis, there are some things that can help aid you um, in making the diagnosis and that includes things such as imaging um, and how someone responds to therapy. So we'll go through that now. Um, so we have the EULA and ACR guidelines. So the EULA stands for the European League Against Rheumatism, um, which always makes me think of a team of superheroes, realistically. And then we've got the American College of Rheumatology guidelines. Um, so they came up with a, a, a list of criteria to help someone make the diagnosis of polymyalgia rheumatica. Now, keep in mind, this was mostly used for, uh, uh, for research settings. 
So uh, it's more to make sure that someone absolutely has polymyalgia rheumatica and may not be completely practical in the real world, but it can be of some assistance. So what they suggested is there's a group of mandatory criteria. So the patients must be over the age of 50. They must have shoulder pain on both sides and they have to have high levels of inflammation in the blood. And then they've got some supporting criteria as we can see below. So again, mostly around that inflammatory pain. So they have to have the morning stiffness for more than 45 minutes. Um, they can have some hip pain as well. They need to have negative blood tests for rheumatoid arthritis and no real other joints should be involved. So that is to say swollen or tender. Um, and then they've got the supportive criteria of ultrasound findings there. Um, and as you can see here, they say if you get four or more points, there's a 70% chance of having polymyalgia rheumatica. But as I alluded to, um, this isn't perfect. So there are flaws to this design and that's why it is perhaps not um, ideal to apply this in a real world setting. So as I mentioned earlier, despite all of our efforts and despite these guidelines, 15% um, of people with a diagnosis of polymyalgia rheumatica are actually falsely diagnosed and go on to develop something else. 10% um, of patients with polymyalgia rheumatica actually have normal levels of inflammation in their blood. So whilst high levels of inflammation in the blood is usually expected and um, quite common to see, um, it is not unreasonable for someone to be diagnosed with polymyalgia rheumatica whilst having normal levels of inflammation. And as we can see in the previous slide, um, you needed to be negative for the rheumatoid arthritis blood test. However, 10% of patients with polymyalgia rheumatica are positive for the rheumatoid arthritis blood test um, and never go on to develop rheumatoid arthritis. So again, these criteria um, can be helpful, um, but they are unfortunately not the be all and end all. So what else can we use if we're still unsure whether someone is suffering from PMR? So we can use some imaging. Um, some examples of imaging tests that can be used are things such as ultrasound. Um, so ultrasound is like what is used in pregnant women. So this, is, uh, this uses sound waves um, that bounce off tissue to give you a picture. And obviously sound waves bounce differently off inflamed tissue compared to regular tissue. Um, and so that can paint a bit of a picture of what exactly is going on in the shoulder. Um, an MRI, this uses a strong magnet to vibrate the water molecules to create a picture. Um, so this, th both the ultrasound and MRI can demonstrate that there's inflammation in the tendons of the shoulder and in that burst of that ball of fluid in the shoulder, not inflammation in the joint itself. And that can be a bit of a clue that uh, we may be dealing with polymyalgia rheumatica. Again, there are some pros and cons to these. Um, so the pros are neither ultrasound or MRI um, have any radiation. Um, they can help aid in making the diagnosis um, and they can also follow treatment. So that is to say, if um, we have started treatment on someone and we want to know if the treatment is working, then both the ultrasound and MRI should demonstrate improvement after treatment. However, they are not perfect tests um, and there are some cons. Um, so some of those are, they can be mistaken for other conditions. So for instance, inflammation of that ball of fluid and the tendons can be seen in things such as rotator cuff disease or in things such as rheumatoid arthritis. Um, the changes disappear quickly once treatment is started. So you may in fact miss the boat if you start treatment um, and then try to get a scan because the um, changes that you would expect um, disappear quite rapidly. Um, and you can get sidetracked. So for instance, it's not uncommon for us to get imaging of the shoulder and it may de um, demonstrate some tears or inflammation in the shoulder. And we may believe that that may be what is contributing or causing um, someone's pain uh, when we may get sidetracked going down the wrong path because of that. It's not uncommon to find things such as tears in, um, in shoulders if we were to scan even healthy people. And of course, there are costs involved with these tests. Um, there's also PET scans. So PET scan stands for positron emission topography. So this is mostly a scan that was uh, that is used for cancer. Um, so basically how this works is all our cells use sugar to make energy or glucose we say. Um, and a PET scan is like putting dyed glucose into the blood um, and f taking a scan to see where it lights up. And naturally, um, the glucose will tend to go to areas that use more energy, so areas where there's inflammation. So inflamed tissue tends to light up more than normal tissue. Um, this is mostly used in the research setting and it's not really used practically um, 
in an everyday scenario. And we can probably see why as we go along here. Um, some of the pros of this, again, it can help you aid the diagnosis. It can help identify some of the complications of PMR, which we'll talk a little bit more about later. So inflammation elsewhere, not just in the tissue. Um, and they can pick up other problems such as infections, for instance. Some of the cons of this um, is unlike the ultrasound and MRI is PET scans do um, involve radiation. Um, once again, the changes disappear quickly once treated. Um, and the cost of a PET scan is a lot more than an ultrasound and somewhat more than an M MRI as well. So again, can be helpful, but not really used in the day-to-day -day setting. Um, so one of the other things we can do, which is quite useful, is a bit of a treatment tri trial. So as we'll talk a little bit more on uh, later in the presentation is the main treatment of PMR is steroids or prednisolone. Um, so steroids are very good at reducing inflammation quite quickly. And since there's a lot of inflammation in PMR, um, steroids are very good at improving symptoms, even at a low dose. Um, so we usually say that for someone to be considered to have PMR, uh, we would usually expect a 70% improvement within three days of starting um, steroid therapy. But it's not uncommon um, for my patients to come back and tell me um, the very next day, it was like a miracle. Um, I could get out of bed. I didn't have any of that morning stiffness. Um, and they love uh, the steroids naturally because it has made them feel um, so much better so quickly. So I often tell my juniors, if you start someone on steroids for PMR and they don't come back tomorrow seeing your praise, um, seriously consider um, whether that we might be dealing with something else. So how do I approach someone uh, with a presumptive diagnosis of PMR? Um, so I use a combination of things. So firstly, and perhaps the most important thing is the history. Um, so is the patient over 50 years old? Do they have the shoulder plus or minus that hip pain? And is it that kind of inflammatory pain? So with the morning stiffness. The inflammatory markers are put there as a sub point because they are really, really helpful, but not um, absolutely necessary to make the diagnosis. I then try to exclude some of the common mimics, such as things such as rheumatoid arthritis, etc. Um, and then if I'm satisfied with that much, then I'll be, uh, commence them on therapy and see their response to it. If they respond very dramatically to, to therapy, then you can feel relatively comfortable in the diagnosis. So what exactly is the management of PMR? Um, so the mainstay of therapy is steroids or prednisolone and steroids are what we call the cornerstone of therapy in PMR. Um, so that means everything else is built upon it realistically. So they work quite quickly at improving both the symptoms and the inflammation um, in the blood. Um, and I always highlight to patients that PMR is more than just pain. Uh, it is quite a lot of inflammation and it's important to not just get the pain under control, but to settle that inflammation down because it can lead to some nasty things things down the line. So it's usually started off at a dose of about 15 to 20 milligrams through a moderate dose. Um, and that may be given for a couple of weeks to one month time before it is slowly cut down. And I've just put in a example regimen there. Um, now this may not be applicable to everyone because it certainly develops, uh, depends on um, each individual's personal circumstances. So some of their other medical problems, um, how severe the symptoms are, etc. So it does need to be tailored individually to each person. And as it's weaned down, we monitor the patient for both their symptoms and their blood work to make sure that we've got it under control. And as you can see in the regimen there, that once we get below 10 milligrams a day, um, that is when there is the biggest risk of relapse. So we take it quite slow. Um, so on that note, um, whilst all patients usually respond quite promptly to steroid therapy, as we cut down, about 50% of patients do suffer a relapse. So it's almost the rule rather than the exception. Um, so don't be disheartened if a relapse happens. Um, a relapse may be as simple as just a little bit of um, rise in their blood work. Um, and if that happens, what, may, what we may need to do is just simply increase the steroid to that last effective dose make sure we get the disease under control and then try again. Um, however, if someone is suffering from significant steroid side effects or they're having recurrent flares and we're finding it difficult to get them off the steroids, um, there is the potentiality that your doctor may consider starting an, another agent, something we call a steroid sparing agent, um, very original as you can imagine. Um, and there are a few options there. Some of the more common ones include something such as methotrexate. So methotrexate is one of those mainstay drugs for rheumatoid arthritis um, and it's an 
It's a medication that stops an enzyme that's important to the immune system. So it works quite well for autoimmune conditions such as this. It's a tablet that's taken once a week um, and can help you um, get off those steroids um, if you're having difficulty doing so. Um, another example that's um, gaining more prominence is something such as tocilizumab. Um, so this blocks interleukin-6. So this is a chemical that is um, a key driver of inflammation. Now, this is uh, given as an injection um, and is mostly, mostly used in the research setting. Um, we know that it works well for similar conditions to PMR and anecdotally it works quite well for PMR. So it's promising, but it's not on the PBS yet for this condition. Um, so mo again, mostly used in the research setting. So what are some of the complications and what, what uh, is important not to miss when someone is diagnosed with PMR? So there's a sister condition of PMR that's known as giant cell arteritis. Um, so this basically uh, is another autoimmune condition uh, which can affect the blood vessels, namely the blood vessels of the head and the ones that supply the eyes. But it can affect a lot of the blood vessels, the larger blood vessels in particular. Um, and why do we say it's a sister condition of PMR? Because um, we know 15% of patients with PMR develop giant cell arteritis. Um, and in fact, 45% of patients with giant cell arteritis um, have PMR as well. So there's quite a little, uh, quite a lot of overlap um, in that regard. Um, and we are always um, concerned about giant cell arteritis and always have our radar up for it um, because if it's left untreated, it can result in loss of vision. So we always take it really, uh, we always take it very seriously. So what are some of the clues that someone may be developing giant cell arteritis? Um, so these patients usually present with headaches, usually on the side of their head. They usually have scalp tenderness, so sore when you touch their scalp. Um, they can develop what we, uh, what we call jaw claudication or jaw fatigue, so they find it tired to continue um, chewing, and they can develop visual problems. So if we suspect someone might be having giant cell arteritis, um, the main test that we have for this is to take a biopsy of the blood vessel just on the side of the head here and we look at it under the microscope um, to see if there are signs that they're developing this kind of vasculitis, so inflammation of blood vessels. Now the biopsy um, on its own unfortunately is not perfect um, and can miss a lot of cases. So if we are still concerned um, or your doctor is still concerned that you might be suffering from giant cell arteritis, uh, they may decide to treat you regardless of what the biopsy says because as we've kind of mentioned it's important not to miss it and the main treatment for this is just a higher dose of steroids uh, and it usually responds quite well to that and that can preserve someone from losing their vision um, the rest of the complications that we'll discuss mostly revolve around the treatment rather than the disease itself. Um, we often refer to prednisolone as a double-edged sword because it's really, really good at what it does, really good at shutting down inflammation quickly, but it can have some detrimental effects. Um, so some of those effects are bone health. Um, so steroids over time can weaken and thin the bone. So uh, it's really important to check a patient's vitamin D and calcium levels, making sure they're up to scratch. Um, to prevent any worsening of their bone health. Um, and it's always important to consider um, whether the patient might be at risk of osteoporosis. So there's a lot of risk scores and calculators out there to identify whether someone is at risk of developing osteoporosis. And one of those risk factors is whether the patient is on steroids. So this can help um, guide people in their decision-making about their bone health. And your doctor may ask for um, something called a bone density scan or a DEXA scan. So that just looks at the strength of the bones to make sure that it's not getting too weak or too brittle because there are things we can do for that. Um, something else that we worry about with um, prednisolone is blood sugars and weight. So um, steroids can increase your blood sugars. So this is particularly more important for people who are suffering from diabetes. Um, and a lot of patients are concerned about weight gain with prednisolone. Um, now, a lot of these side effects that we talk about with prednisolone are dose related. Um, so as the dose is lower, 
the chances of these um, become lesser and less of a factor. Um, and something else I remind my patients is, uh, whilst we concern ourselves with weight and prednisolone, prednisolone on its own does not actually put on weight, but what it can do is it can make people hungrier. Um, so for both of these instances, it's important to test people for diabetes um, when we begin, uh, begin prednisolone to make sure we're not pushing their sugars up too high. Um, and if they are suffering from diabetes, it does mean that we may have to monitor their sugars a bit uh, more closely. Um, and I, we advise patients to monitor the calorie intake to try to offset um, any of that weight gain realistically. I believe someone last time asked, um, is something like diabetes or osteoporosis a contraindication to using steroids in PMR? Um, and the answer to that is no. Um, it would make you a little bit more cautious and a little bit more um, watchful, um, I suppose is the best way to phrase it. Um, so for instance, if someone is a diabetic, I would still treat them much the same, but I would be watching their sugars more closely and perhaps treating their diabetes more aggressively um, to com uh, counteract some of those steroid effects. And and again, with osteoporosis, it would be important to make sure that their bone health is as strong as possible and using whatever we need to, such as medication to strengthen their bones, to again try to counteract some of those steroid effects. So what can you do to improve recovery? Um, so one of the most important things is to stay active. Um, so after a period of inactivity that usually comes from poly, uh, suffering from polymyalgia rheumatica, um, a lot of people can feel quite deconditioned and weak. So getting back into activity can help restore your function and prevent um, some of that deconditioning. Um, we know that inflammation loves stagnant joints. So inflammation loves it when you have not been moving and that's why patients often feel worse first thing in the mornings. So being active helps reduce a lot of that pain and stiffness and also helps um, limit a lot of that the weight and sugar complications that the prednisone may contribute to that we talked about earlier. So it helps you get back to your regular activity sooner. Um, so what are some of the things we can do? Light and low impact activity um, such as swimming um, is often really good and I believe someone last time um, did highlight and, and I completely agree that swimming um, in the traditional sense such as freestyle may exacerbate your shoulders naturally but when we say swimming we mean things like water walking because um, moving in the water provides that resistance so it's a, a bit more of a workout and it takes the weight off the joints so people often find that they tolerate this better particularly in early stages of the disease um, and as we can as we improve in terms of our pain and stiffness we can graduate to more cardiovascular intense activities um, we can work on our bone strength. So as we get older, we are all more prone to developing things such as osteoporosis and, and weakness of our bones. Um, so doing weight-based exercises um, in general is really great at helping prevent that and helping keep our bones nice and strong um, for the future. Um, eating a balanced diet. Um, again, this is just common sense. This will keep your um, cardiovascular health um, in tip top shape, but it'll also help prevent some of the weight gain um, that we mentioned and it will improve our overall health and well being. Um, something else that's really important is stopping smoking. So we know smoking is a big driver for inflammation. And in fact, it's actually a direct trigger to developing something like rheumatoid arthritis. So this may be a good wake up call and a good um, motivator to help try to um, stop or at the very least cut down our smoking because um, this will improve our heart and vessel health and help reduce a lot of that inflammation. Um, it's also really important to follow the prescribed steroid plan. Now, I know a lot of people um, are afraid of steroids and don't really like them, um, but this is very much a, a case of um, the tortoise and the hare. Okay, so um, the number one reason um, I see patients who have uh, relapsed in polymyalgia rheumatica or have failed therapy is when themselves or their doctor or perhaps even myself sometimes have gone a little bit over ambitious at cutting their steroids down. We all want to get off steroids um, and as quickly as possible, but if we take it too quickly, um, that is the biggest risk of developing a relapse and um, we may in fact have to start from scratch. Um, so in the long term, you may end up taking more steroids if you try to um, cut them down too aggressively than if we took a slow and steady um, approach at cutting it down. So it's the best way to get, uh, best way to get the disease under control and the best chance we have at getting someone off um, steroids um, without relapses essentially.
Um, so what are some of the questions my patients ask me? Um, does PMR go away? Um, and the answer to that is yes. In the vast majority of patients, it, do, it is self-limiting. So more than 90% of people are able to come off steroids completely within one to two years um, without any further relapses. So again, um, it's quite good news that you should be able to get off the treatment um, eventually with resolution of symptoms, which is really reassuring. Can you die from PMR? The answer is no, not directly, unless you have one of those complications, for instance. Um, in fact, um, a lot of studies have suggested that people with PMR tend to live longer than people without PMR. Um, and the thought process behind this is perhaps patients with PMR um, get much closer uh, medical monitoring. So they have things like their blood pressure checked regularly, their sugars checked, their weight checked, things such as uh, things such as, these, such as these, and perhaps that's why they live longer. So there may in fact be some kind of silver lining, I guess, um, at the end of the day with getting a diagnosis of PMR. Um, do I have to take steroids? Unfortunately, the answer is in the vast majority, yes. Um, so as we mentioned earlier, steroids are the mainstay of therapy. They work quite rapidly at not just getting the pain under control, but shutting down that inflammation process and preventing a lot of those nasty complications. So this gives you the best chance of recovering. Whilst there are other medications that can help, which we talked a little bit about earlier, um, when they're more useful at keeping the disease under control um, when you can't get off the steroids. They're not as good at getting the disease under control, if that makes sense. So they can keep the fire out, but they're not very good at putting the fire out, um, as I often explain to my patients. Um, but on the flip side of this is if um, you are suffering from steroid side effects such as jitteriness or high blood sugars or anything along those lines, it's not something that you just need to suffer in silence. Please let your um, doctor know, talk to your doctor about this because there's a lot of ways we can get around a lot of the um, side effects that some people may notice uh, with prednisolone. Um, are there any natural alternatives is another really common question. Um, the answer to this is yes and no. So there are some natural supplements that can help in terms of symptoms. Um, they not, um, they're not um, effective at changing the disease trajectory. So they're not really good at shutting the disease off, but they can help with the symptoms. So for instance, some examples include things such as vitamin D. So vitamin D is um, really important for bone health. Um, so this can help keep your bones strong, particularly if you're deficient in vitamin D. You'll hear a lot of people talking about magnesium. So magnesium is quite good for muscle cramps, not so much the muscle pain that some people feel with polymyalgia rheumatica, but if cramps is something that you experience a lot, particularly at night, um, things such as a magnesium supplement can help with this. Um, a lot of people also talk about curcumin. So curcumin is the active part of turmeric, um, and this can be quite good at um, helping reduce inflammation. However, you do need to take quite high doses of curcumin for this to be effective. Um, so a lot of the turmeric supplements, for instance, won't have enough curcumin in it. You need the pure curcumin and quite high doses. And similar can be said for fish oil. So fish oil, again, at very high doses, so more the liquids rather than the capsules can also help reduce inflammation. So those two can help with the symptoms of PMR, but again, unfortunately, they don't really shut that inflammation process. Um, another question is, can Panadol and Nurofen help? So again, yes and no. So that once again, they can help with the symptoms, but not quite shut the disease process off. Um, and you can also use things like um, Voltaren gel, so the anti-inflammatory gels. Again, they can sometimes um, help somewhat with the symptoms um, as well if you can't take the tablets. And I would always um, talk to your doctor um, if you are going to use something like Nurofen or any other anti-inflammatory if you're on the prednisolone because they work in similar ways, so there might be overlap there as well. Um, I believe someone asked, I forgot to answer this earlier, what is the natural um, history of PMR if they weren't to take um, therapy? Um, and the long and short of it is um, autoimmune diseases like PMR, 
tend to wax and wane. So there are periods where it'll be more active than others, periods where it might be quiet for a while and periods where it's more aggressive. So that will continue. Um, it is possible for PMR to kind of burn out on its own over a couple of years. That is a possibility, but it, um, that means if it's left untreated for that time, it can lead to a lot of debility and pain um, during that time and can develop some of those complications that we spoke about earlier. So it's always really good to try to shut the disease off quickly um, before it can um, develop and cause significant impairment realistically. And I believe someone else asked, um, is type 1 diabetes related to PMR? Um, and again, the short answer is no, not directly. So there's no direct link between type 1 diabetes and um, PMR. Um, though we do know that people who suffer from one autoimmune condition are more likely um, to develop another. So in that case, you can um, suggest that there is perhaps a link um, between type 1 diabetes and PMR, but that would be um, true of any kind of autoimmune problem. Um, so where can I go for more inf uh, information? Um, so obviously you can refer to Musculoskeletal Australia and I've put a link there to their um, summary and handout about Polymarja Aromatica. So you can have a read of that in simple English um, for a bit more detail. And they do have a helpline there and they do have some support groups um, available as well. So that can be quite useful. We also have Arthritis Australia. They too have a handout um, regarding Polymarja Aromatica and also a helpline and support groups that you can refer to as well. If you're looking for just inf uh, information, um, there's the Mayo Clinic um, from the United States. They have quite a good um, lay-term explanation of polymyodramatica with useful links there as well. But if you're looking for something more local as well, we've got the Better Health Channel. <clears throat> Again, they have some more information about polymyodramatica. Um, there's obviously Facebook groups as well. Um, I always um, tell people to take Facebook groups with a bit of a grain of salt and be a bit cautious with them. They are very, very useful um, to be able to share ideas and bounce things off other people who are going through the same things as you um, and find out what's worked for them and what hasn't. But as I mentioned, always just double check the information you're getting from there with your doctor, because as you've kind of uh, seen in the presentation so far, um, everyone's um, experience of PMR can be different. Everyone's treatment can be um, subtly different as well. So what works for them may not be um, quite as applicable to you as well. So it's always good to just double check that, but that can be a, a, a resource as well. So in summary, um, PMR is a condition um, that tends to affect those over the age of 50 and gets more common as we get older. Um, whilst genetics play a part, we don't fully know what causes p uh, PMR. Um, it's a condition that results in pain, in pain and stiffness, primarily in the shoulders and hips, uh, which is worse in the morning and gets better with use. Um, diagnosis is based on a combination of things, including the history, excluding other common um, mimics and um, a patient's response to therapy, though imaging can help as well. Steroids is the mainstay of treatment, but most patients are able to get off them um, within two years. And however, relapses are common that may necessitate a little bit of a rise in steroid dose um, and a retrial, essentially. Uh, so thank you very much for joining me once again. Um, and hopefully you found this useful and everyone is staying safe in this day and age. Uh, thank you very much and have a good night.